All right, and we are now going live. Hello, hello. This is Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop. Thanks for joining me for this week's episode of the Sonic Scoop podcast. If you're watching this live in the live stream, let me know if you can see me and hear me in the chat box. Thanks for joining us. We've got a whole bunch of members joining us today. Music 7, Benj, Skeleton Pete. Great to have all of you here. And we've got a great topic. Right now, we're going to be diving into getting mixes that translate. What does that idea mean, mixes that translate? Mixes that sound right no matter where you are. Mixes that work in the car, mixes that work in the club, mixes that work on headphones. Mixes that don't only work in your studio. This is something that I have struggled with. Let me know in the comments or in the chat box if you're live, if you have experienced this issue before as well, of working on something, having it sound pretty good in your space, and then taking it out for the car check, throwing it on earbuds, listening to it on your phone and just everything kind of crumbling or like being afraid to take it to the club or to a friend's studio or onto a big system. Like you want to feel about your your mixes, your productions when they're finally ready to be released to the world. That Like you're excited to go hear them on a big system in someone else's nicer studio. And then you get there and you're like, uh, whoa, can we turn this off really fast? And you start making excuses for your own work. I think we've all been there at some point. If you haven't been through that part of the struggle, you just, you're probably not good enough to notice where your mixes are yet, right? Anyone who's gotten good has gone through this at some point. Let me know if you can relate. This is definitely something that I went through, but it's something that I don't go through anymore. As a mastering engineer today, that's the bulk of my audio work, I should probably be fired if I was going to be surprised about how my mixes turned out when I heard them on different systems or my, how my masters would turn out, how my clients' mixes turn out on other systems because it's kind of my job to help with translation. But you shouldn't leave translation just up to the mastering engineer. Ideally, I say this again and again and again, the best sounding, most impressive masters that I do are the ones that come from the best sounding, most impressive mixes. And the masters that I do that sound the best on the greatest variety of systems come from the mixes that sound the best on the greatest variety of systems. So the earlier on you can get this happening in the process, the better. And when you start getting really good, you realize that the best best mixes come out of the best productions, the best arrangements, the best performances, the best recordings. But we're going to be looking at this through the lens of mixing, but pretty much everything we talk about today is going to apply at every stage of the production process. Let's get right into it with the number one reason your mixes don't translate to other systems. The number one reason that you have a mix that sounds pretty decent in your listening spot, and then you go to other places and it just falls flat. And the number one reason is you don't have your monitoring together yet. And you need to think about your monitoring, your listening situation, the speakers that you're on, as not being just about your speakers or just about your headphones. We'll talk about that too. We'll talk a little bit about even mixing on headphones so they translate to speakers. I've got some great ideas for you there. But just starting with speakers, you got to think about your speakers as not just speakers. Your speakers are a system. That involve the speakers you select, the room that they're in, how they're placed in the room, how they're placed in the room relative to you, and then maybe additional processing that's happening on your speakers. So one mistake that I see so many people make when they finally want to go to get better speakers, better studio monitors, is they make a studio monitor budget. And they say, this is how much I have to spend on studio monitors. And they just go and get decent studio monitors. And everything else is an afterthought. But in reality, because your studio monitors are not just your monitors, your monitoring is a system that includes your room and you. When you come up with your budget for speakers, don't make it a speaker budget. Make it a monitoring budget. A lot of people say, all right, I'm ready to get serious. I'm going to spend $1,000, $1,500, $2,000 on monitors. What monitor should I get, Justin? I, I want to spend $1,500. I want to get serious about this. Should I get the Adams, the Dyn Audios? Uh, you know, which, which brand of speakers should I get in this price range? 
I like to fire back annoying questions. And one of the annoying questions I like to fire back is, well, what's your overall monitoring budget? And it's like, well, what do you mean? I have a speaker budget. No! Psh, psh, psh. Stop having a speaker budget. Have a monitoring budget. You have $1,500 to spend on studio monitors or you have $1,500 to spend on your listening setup? Because those are two very different questions. You can get into some really good monitoring speaker setups where you're maybe spending between $1,000 and $2,000 on speakers, but then to make them really be worth $1,000 to $2,000, you're spending $1,000 to $2,000 on prefabricated acoustic treatment. And then maybe you're spending a few hundred dollars more on EQ correction that makes all these things work well. And you're not just putting these things in haphazardly. You've got to think about... How are my speakers actually placed in my room? Don't just put them up where they're convenient. I actually have a whole video, I can link to it here and in the uh, description down below, about how to properly place your speakers in the room. I've got a whole video on basics to acoustic treatment, but this is the first thing. If you're gonna be doing your work mostly on monitors, don't think about just monitors, think about the whole room ecosystem that they live in. Because honestly, if your mixes don't translate from your room to say a car to another studio, there's actually a good chance you're in a listening environment where your mixes don't translate if you're sitting here versus sitting here. And all of a sudden, you scoot six inches back, a foot back, and the whole mix changes. All of your low end changes. So that's something super big to think about. Is that getting things to translate is about getting into a listening environment you can trust. And a whole lot of our points today, there's seven of them. I'm going to cheat. I say there's seven. There's really going to be eight. And I might go even a little deeper than that. But there's seven main secrets to doing this. And the first big one is having a monitoring situation that you can trust. And a lot of them run that same theme, but some of them are specific techniques and techniques and tricks you can do to get stuff to translate. And it's going to get better and better as it goes along. But just one last point that I want to make on this stuff is this is true no matter how much you have to spend. If you have an overall monitoring budget of $600, you could get a $300 set of speakers, $300 in like acoustic treatment materials that you're going to build together yourself. And then maybe at that point, you're foregoing the EQ correction, something like Sonarworks or something like that. You're forgoing that initially, but then you're adding that on later. That's one way to go. But this scales up. When you're ready to be really serious and want the $1,500 monitors, that those $1,500 monitors should be part of like a $2,000 or $3,000 room budget. And if you can't do that and your budget's just $1,500, you might be better off looking at less expensive monitors that cost you between $500 and $800 and having some room left over for acoustic treatment, whether that's a DIY acoustic treatment, plenty of resources about that in video and article form on the Sonic Scoop website, ways to make this stuff super cost effective for you. But here's the reality. You want really good kind of professional level monitoring you can trust. You're probably starting to look at speakers in the range of $1,000 to $2,000 and then acoustic treatment in the range of $1,000 to $2,000 and then maybe some EQ correction. And then all that is adding up to something like $2,000 to $3,000 in speakers. But you don't have to spend that much. I am not here to tell you that the answer to all of your monitoring problems is you just have to spend a few thousand dollars. That's not my point at all. Because you can actually solve some of these monitoring problems so much less expensively than this. On the other end, speakers go up from there. Right now, I don't even have them in the shot. These beautiful Ex Machina speakers that are in front of me. I think they're between $8,000 and $10,000 for the pair this size. They're great speakers that I'm on. So speaker solutions go up from there. But you don't have to spend $8,000 or $10,000 to get great results. We'll get into less expensive ways to get great results in just a second. But I want you to think about that, that you need to have monitoring situation that you can trust. That's rule number one. And it's not just about the speakers. It's about the whole enchilada. And the analogy I like to give people is before you spend a ton of money on speakers, think about this. Would you rather that I give you my $10,000 set of speakers here? And the rule is that you can mix on them as much as you want. These are your new speakers, but you're only allowed to mix in a gymnasium, like on a basketball court. That's option number one. Or option number two, 
I put you in my relatively well-treated room with one of these. And you have to mix on this. This, in the decently well-treated room, will you can get one of these for a couple hundred, few hundred bucks. This, in the decently well-treated room, it doesn't even need to have a ton of low-frequency control because there's not a ton of low-frequency on this monitor. This is an Oritone. I have a great roundup of Oritones, by the way, on the Sonic Scoop website, all the modern iterations of them. Mixing on this in a halfway decently treated room will give you infinitely better results than mixing on a $10,000 set of speakers on a basketball court. I hope you can feel that one in your bones, because that's the take-home of this point. I always front-load these podcast episodes with my most long-winded talk on the first point. This is how I get warmed up. But we're going to go quicker and quicker from here as we go along. And the last idea I want to uh, give you uh, uh, on this idea of spending, before we get on to point number two, is if spending two to three thousand to four thousand dollars on monitoring solution, including room treatment, sounds excessive to you, but then you go out and buy a two thousand dollar compressor or a two thousand dollar preamp, or you spend over the course of the year two thousand dollars in plugins that aren't actually doing new things for you, you have your priorities backwards. You will again get better results getting your monitoring situation, and not just your speakers, your whole listening environment, including speaker placement, getting that set up is so much better for you. Just doing that and using like stock plugins and basic microphones will get you so much further than spending a ton out on gear and not getting your monitoring, your listening right. And I have to hammer this home again and again and again and repeating the same point again and again and again because it's one of these unsexy things that we don't want to accept that all of the best people who do all, do all of the best work know for sure is like the key component, co- component. Because here's the thing. Once you can trust what you're hearing, you can kind of do whatever you want. And a lot of the problems that you have with both translation and mixing in general and production choices and EQing in general have to do with not confidently trusting what you hear and say, saying to yourself, that sounds good to me. I'll just go and do that. Good. That sounds better. Done. All of the second guessing, or at least a good portion of the second guessing you're doing, comes from not being able to hear definitively, confidently what's going on. So this is number one thing to do. And now I'm going to give you a cheap hack to how you can get good mixes without having to do all of the spending. Item number two. I am going to give you a cheat code. Something that you have been told for years you're not allowed to do, but guess what? It's a new era and you're allowed to do it. Thing number two for translation. People would have told you, even a handful of years ago, that you should not do thing number two if you want good translation. And that is mix on headphones. Because here's the reality. You want to get into a basic, like, good studio monitoring situation where you're having professional level monitoring. You're starting at $1,000 to $2,000 on speakers, $1,000 to $2,000 on acoustic treatment, a few hundred dollars on some additional EQ correction. You're spending somewhere between you know, $2,000 and 4000 bucks on solving your monitoring situation to a professional degree. For $2,000 to $4,000, you could get the best headphones ever made in the history of headphones that you might actually be able to trust even better than that speaker monitoring situation we're talking about. If you had $1,500 to spend, you could start to get a pretty good system that you could actually get pretty good results on, or you could get some amazing headphones for $1,500. And additionally, you could spend... $300 on a pair of headphones and get headphones that you can trust and make critical listening decisions on. You are allowed to mix on headphones, but there's two big rules when it comes to mixing on headphones. One is that not every set of headphones will do the trick. And rule number two around headphones is that even if they are headphones that'll do the trick, Just like with any monitoring situation, you've got to learn them. 
And you've also got to select headphones that will suit your biases. So let's break this down a little bit further. Number one thing about having headphones that are useful as a really good secondary reference or even a primary reference is low frequency response of those headphones. If you're going to be mixing predominantly on headphones, you need to have headphones that give you some honest information at 100 hertz and below. And a lot of headphones are not going to do that for you. There's only a handful of pairs of headphones that I can recommend that do this. The least expensive ones that I have liked for this have been the Blues. These are the Blue Mix Fi headphones. I listen to every single master I do on these headphones. They have a built-in amp that I leave off, so they're basically the same as the Blue Lola headphones. There's two problems with the solution that I'm giving you. One is that the ear pads, like, they disintegrate. <laughs> Any Blue headphone owners here, you know, you, you know that if you wear these headphones, they'll be spilkus all over you. And the other two, second big problem about these headphones is that they're probably being discontinued for exactly that reason. It's my understanding that they're not going to be making these headphones anymore. At least that's the word on the street. And it's a shame because for around $300 or even less, closer to $250 or even Lola, lower on the Lola headphones, they had actual low frequency information that I could trust and that I really understood and got to know. And I could make actual decisions about things happening in the 60 hertz range on these headphones. They have this semi-open, semi-closed design that just gives them actual usable information in even the sub-frequency area. Phenomenal. You're not going to find that on a lot of headphones, especially at this price, with these guys getting discontinued, possibly in part because of the spilkus that's coming off of them right here, for those of you who can see on the video version. Uh, hopefully, either they come out with a revised version of these or some other brand does. Uh, I'm not even getting sponsorship money for mentioning this. They're just the things that I use. And I've listened to literally every single master that I've done since I started mastering uh, outside of the Joe Lambert Mastering Studio and built my own room. I've listened to every single master I've done on these headphones. And when I'm traveling, I can master an entire record on these headphones and get the same results that I get at home in my actual real studio on my good speakers because I know them that well. And the reality is that more and more people at a super high level are starting to understand that yes, you can mix on headphones. We recently did an interview with a great mixer, Manny Marikeen, on the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. Uh, no, I'm sorry, on the Sonic Scoop website. That was an, a written interview, sonicscoop.com. Look up Manny Marikeen mixing on headphones. He's now started mixing on headphones, brand called Audizy, I believe is how you pronounce it. They make phenomenal stuff, really, really expensive headphones, but their highest end LCD4 headphones for like $4,000 are uh, ridiculously good. They're some of the best headphones I've ever heard. If you're going to spend a little bit less than that, though, I think there are other brands that uh, at certain price points beat them. But they make, and that's just my personal opinion and my taste there, your taste might be different. But Manny Marikeen doing some of the best work out there. He's worked with I don't know, Bruno Mars, Imagine Dragons, Rihanna, like everything, pop, R&B, hip hop, like multi, multi platinum selling stuff. He's in a place where he's like, I don't always have to be in my studio in front of the SSL, in front of the big monitors. These headphones are telling me things that I need to know. One of my friends, Ariel Bourgeau, he's worked with the Chainsmokers and Madonna and Biggie and so many others. Great engineer, great guy. He swore me to secrecy years ago when he first started mixing on headphones. I wouldn't tell anyone he was mixing on headphones. I don't think I'm sworn to secrecy anymore because the reason I was sworn to secrecy is because at that point he was living in Brooklyn. He couldn't get to the studio all the time. Not every project could he justify going down to the studio for. So he would do a lot of his mixing on headphones at his dining room table watching his kid in the mornings. And now he has his own studio. He's moved out uh, elsewhere in New York and he has his own studio in his house that he can go to all the time so he doesn't have to mix on headphones all the time. But he got really good results when he was mixing on headphones. And you can do this. You are allowed. And sometimes some money spent on better headphones and getting to know them is absolutely worthwhile. I'll give you yet another person who'd endorse this. Glenn Schick one of the great mastering engineers out there. He mastered this J. Cole record, a rap record that so many people gave accolades to for its sound quality and how it sounded and that it wasn't trying to like push things just for the loudness one. It was a cool sounding record. 
He's done, you know, Justin Bieber too. All huge stuff all over the map. You know, he is now mastering exclusively on headphones on a laptop. I've interviewed him twice about it. He uses plugins and headphones. Granted, they're a $4,000 pair of headphones to master super high level records. And that's all he does. And it's not hurting him to do it. So you have license to go out there and try mastering on or mixing on headphones. But I've told you, one, you've got to have headphones that give you useful information in low frequencies. I throw out these blues as one option. The new Neumann headphones, the closed back ones, actually have really good low frequency response, in my opinion, for closed back headphones. Sometimes the high frequencies can suffer a little bit more on closed back headphones. Uh, Neumann just come out with an open back pair. I'm really excited to check out. There's one coming in the mail right now. I hope to do a roundup of some of the best options for headphones for mixing and mastering. I did such a roundup a couple of years ago. You can find that on the sonicscoop.com website, but I'm going to update it with some of these new models that have since come out, and maybe I'll do a video overview of some of these headphones too. Let me know if that would be interesting to you uh, down here in the comments because that's, uh, that would be fun for me to do. I love nerding out about headphones. So there's some good options there. But the second thing that you that makes it so that not all headphones will work for you is that high frequencies are like a roller coaster on headphones. The upper mids and the highs, they're all over the place most of the time in most headphones. Some of the flatter headphones in the higher frequencies, among them would be the Sennheiser HD 600s, HD 650s, Really good high frequency and upper mid range response, but in my opinion, a little bit low in the low frequencies. They don't have as much useful information, 100 hertz and below. So for me, they could only ever be a secondary reference. Like I would not feel comfortable going on the road with those, making final decisions about low frequencies using those particular headphones, my opinion. There are other brands out there that a lot of people like that can be fun to listen to that I've heard people get good results with, but you again have to get to know the roller coaster of high frequencies. Bayer Dynamic are a good example of this. They have some headphones that a lot of people like and that are useful, but you've got to get to know like, okay, this particular model of headphones, it's giving me a lot of extra stuff at 12K, but not at 8K. And then there is a hump at, you know, 4K, but not at 6K. Whatever particular model you're on, you've really got to learn the idiosyncrasies of their response. But you can learn almost ever, any set of headphones and almost any room, given enough practice, which is something we'll talk about more and more as we go along. Before we leave this idea of, yes, you're allowed to mix on headphones, whether as a secondary reference or just a good double, you know, duplicate reference, you should also consider having a secondary set of monitors. Even if you have a super nice set of monitors, I recommend something like, I'm going to grab them again, cube style monitors of some type. That's what I like. Some people like NSN, uh, NS10 style monitors. Those are cool too. But both those types of speakers do something special. It doesn't just have to be this. There are also ways to Bluetooth stream out to your phone so you can listen out of your phone speakers. An app like uh, Audio Movers Listen To can allow you to listen on all sorts of Bluetooth equipped consumer devices checking your mixes on earbuds, things like that. Having multiple different speakers that you listen to your mixes on, totally valid. Michael Brower, who I've interviewed a few times, he does a lot of his mixing on a kind of consumery, boomboxy set of speakers. And he doesn't even have them up front as mains. He has them off to the side in the back somewhere, which is often how my Oratones were set up. You'd see them in a lot of shots They'd be uh, over my shoulder because that's really how I set them up for mixing. They're not in the shot so much anymore because I put up some atoms when I was auditioning those and uh, I never took them down because they look pretty in the shot. But right now those, those speakers aren't even hooked up in case you're wondering. And uh, these days as a mastering engineer, I find that for mastering, for me, one good set of speakers that I know and trust complemented by one good set of headphones that I know and trust does it. But in my mixing days, I usually had two or three sets of monitors that I'd flip between, and I'd recommend something like that can help with the translation. But this brings us to item number three. The reason that so many people like mixing on something like Oritones or Yamaha NS10s is because they make you focus on the mid-range. 
And if, when you're mixing, you focus on the mid-range, you're much more likely to get mixes that translate everywhere. Why is that? Well, here's the thing with low-frequency instruments. Kick, bass, stuff like that. If you're in a room where you can't 100% trust your lows, you don't 100% know if what they're telling you is accurate and how it's going to translate to other rooms, the very best thing that you can do is say, all right, what if the low frequencies weren't there at all? How would I balance the mid-range of the kick versus the mid-range of the bass? Let me not mess around with the lows at all. Let me get the mid-range of those elements to sit right in the mix. Let me make it so you could hear my kick and bass even on small speakers, even on earbuds, even on the phone. And forcing yourself to focus on the mid-range will help you get better low-end by making sure your low-end elements can be heard on any system because they can really be heard in the audible range. And you're not counting on just moving air and giving people a low woofy feeling to have those instruments speak. One of the big reasons that your mixes don't translate to other environments, if they don't translate to other environments, is that you're making choices about balancing low-end instruments like kick and bass by listening predominantly to just the low frequencies. And you're getting so much of the feeling of the low frequencies, you can sense them, you can feel them, that you never stop and think and say, what if those lows weren't there? Could I still hear my kick? Could I still hear my bass? Is the average person on an average system going to be able to hear them? If they're listening on their phone or their laptop or their earbuds, are they going to be able to hear those things? And a smaller, more mid-rangey set of speakers will help you make those kinds of decisions. Because if you can hear your kick and your bass on this speaker, you're going to hear them everywhere, and you're going to have much fewer translation problems. Because if like the whole bulk of your bass tone is just centered around 70 and 80 hertz, and then all of a sudden you hear this one system that doesn't have 70 or 80 hertz in it, your bass disappears. Or you're listening on another system that's just overly hyped in 70 to 80 hertz, you're like, my bass shouldn't be that loud, what's going on? Because you're relying so much on low frequencies to do all the heavy lifting of getting the bass or the kick to sit in the mix, because you're doing that, when you go to other systems that have different low end than you had in your room, even if your low end was super flat in your room, let's pretend you had perfect low end in your room. Even if your low end was perfect, if you were relying exclusively on low end, to get your low-end instrument to sit in the mix, when you go to some other weird room that has weird low-end, they're going to sound wildly off. Whereas if you made sure that part of the reason your kick and bass were audible is that you got their mid-range right, so they could be heard on any system, you're going to have fewer problems with the translation. Because when you get to that room that has too little 70 and 80 hertz, you're still hearing that bass because you made sure you did the right things with it in the mid-range. When you get into that room that is amplifying your bass too much, it's not like your kick's totally disappearing because that mid-range click or attack is still there and is still present. So that's the other big thing I want you to do to focus on to get your mixes to translate everywhere is actually obsess less, not more, about the extreme low frequencies that you're having trouble with. Because if you can get your mixes 100% right in the mids, have yourself or a mastering engineer goosing up and down the lows overall a little bit becomes so easy. If you had to do an entire mix where you couldn't hear your bottom end, you got the mid-range 100% right, and then you brought it to a mastering engineer, or brought it to the perfect room, or brought it to a, up on a frequency analyzer, and saw that, ooh, overall this mix has too much 100 hertz or too little 100 hertz, that is such an easy problem relative to the problem where you were using your low frequencies predominantly to make the kick and the bass sit in the mix. And now the fact that 100 hertz is a little bit off in your mix means like your whole mix is going to have problems, translation problems, and a whole bunch of... Th and when it comes back from mastering, we've scooted 100 hertz up or down to where it should be, things are going to fall apart. So that is item number three. Focus on the mid-range. All right, item number four is work with a human mastering engineer. One of the big reasons 
that your stuff doesn't translate is that you're hearing it in environments alongside other records that you love the sound of. And those other records that you love the sound of have been mastered. So even if you don't use a human mastering engineer and use an AI mastering engineer to master your stuff, just the idea of getting your stuff actually mastered can make it sit better. One of the reasons it might not be standing up to other things on playlist, playlist or in other environments is because you're listening to mastered material and your material is effectively unmastered. So get your material mastered. But the human mastering engineer thing is big. Because a human mastering engineer can give you feedback about what they had to do to make your mix translate better across environments. This is one of the most valuable things I think I do for my mastering clients. It's not even mastering the record for them, for some of them. For those of them who want to become really good at mixing, or those who want to become mastering engineers themselves, like I encourage them to take advantage of me, like steal from me. I have had mastering clients who've gone on to become mastering engineers and they only ever hired me to do mastering so that they could hear what I did to their tracks, have me tell them exactly what I did to their tracks, have them play around with it, see if they could beat my masters, get to a place where they're like, man, I'm going back and forth. I feel like I got to sound just like Justin's master. On this next one, I'm going to see if I can you know, beat him to the punch and do an even better master than him. I've had people use me as a mastering engineer so that they could become mastering engineers themselves. And I ain't the least bit angry about it. We're in a world of 8 billion or so people. I'm totally okay with it. If you want to use me in that way, do it. But so many mixing engineers, this is a much more common thing, a mixing engineer will come to me. Their first mix will have maybe a significant number of problems. They'll ask me for feedback. When they ask for the feedback, I'll give the feedback. And they say, what's up? What did you have to do? Your master sounds so much better than my mix. And I'll tell them exactly what I did. Well, there's a few balance things, right? Your vocal, not as loud as the vocal on your favorite records and not as compressed as the vocal on a lot of your favorite records. That's like thing number one that'll come up, especially people who are mixing their own voices. They're too sensitive to put on enough vocal compression and to bring their vocal loud enough. So that's one thing that'll come up, especially people who are mixing themselves. They're too shy with compressing the vocal and bringing up the mix. So maybe that's one piece of feedback they got. Maybe their cymbals were too loud in a certain section and there is these kind of bright aspects that came out a bit too much when the overall mix got brightened up to live in the same world as some of their favorite sounding records. Maybe they were a little dark compared to some of their favorite sounding records. And then maybe I had a note about the kick or the bass and, hey, you know, your kick is a lot tubbier, not as tight as other stuff in your genre or vice versa. So I might give some of those notes, and then I might give overall frequency balance notes. What I did on this one is I had to bring down stuff below 60 hertz by a dB and a half, or I had to bring up 60 hertz by a dB, and right here around 100, 120, there was an overabundance in the fundamental of the kick, and I had to suck that down a little bit, and that brought the low end into a lot better balance. And then you had a lot of stuff going on. There's this big hump right around 8K. Maybe you're using the same mic on like every single instrument, and that area just got a little bit you know, it's just too much in that area. So maybe I use some dynamic EQ there. And I give them those notes and they come back with their next mix and they've cu cut all those things off of the past. They've already addressed all those in the next mix that comes in. And they're like, what do I do now, coach? What, how, how did it go? How did, how did it turn out? And I'm like, well, I had to do half as much stuff. You still have to pay me the same rate, <laughs> but I did half as much stuff. Now the only thing I'm hearing is, you know, right here at 50 hertz or 60 hertz, I had to come up a tiny bit or come down a little bit, and maybe you had a little bit more in this 1K region than is ideal, and if you want a little bit more of a streamlined, glossy sound like some of those records you were really loving, that this 1K region is a little bit too much, so I, I tuck that down a little bit, and then maybe you went a little bit wider, or maybe you, you went so wide this time. I told you to go a little wider last time, you went so wide, I actually tucked it back in a hair. And, and that's what got it to feel right next to your favorite records. And I tell them that. And then the next time they come back, they're like, all right. And they have an even better mix. What now, coach? You know, not that they literally say what now, coach, but you get the idea. That's how they're treating me. And after we've gone through a few projects together, it's like the master I do for them becomes almost a formality. 
Now, even if an AI mastering engineer could do as good of a job as a human mastering engineer, which I do not think they can do yet at this point, even if they could, do you yet get that from the AI mastering engineer? Maybe someday you will. Maybe they'll someday be AI, you know, mixed critique coaches or something like that. I think it's less likely because of how much tastes evolve and change, but I don't know. If you feed it enough references, maybe it can tell you about what the differences are between your references and your record. And who knows, if AI gets smart enough, maybe it can tell you the top 10 tricks to make your record sound more like some of the other references, if that was the goal. But the other thing about human beings is that exactly copying other references is not necessarily the goal, and knowing when to go left from a certain reference, or which references to steer more towards, or when to ignore them completely, and where to ignore them completely, based on the differences in your track and theirs, that's something that, I don't know, comes down to taste. And can AI have taste? I don't know. I hope not. <laughs> if AI can have taste, we're doomed! But I think that is an important thing, that you can have coaches, feedback, constructive criticism from people that you trust who help you with the translation problem. And this is one thing I really want to hammer home because so many people look to technical solutions and technique solutions to their problems. And if you're having a problem with translation, sometimes a personal human solution is a better solution to the problem of getting something like translation to work than just techniques and technology. So now we've gone all the way through, is that number five? One, two, three, four, five. Working with a human mastering engineer. Number six is doing something that human mastering engineers do. Let me recount this list. One, two, three, four. That was four. I had a two B in there. Number five is something that human mastering engineers do, and I imagine AI mastering engineers do as well, which is use frequency analyzers. This is totally allowed. You can use frequency analyzers. One of the biggest problems you're gonna have with translation is going to be in your extreme low frequencies and your extreme high frequencies. In part because these are the hardest things to get right in speakers, and in part because these are the hardest things to get right in your room. Flutter echo, disproportionately upper and upper mid frequencies gonna be affected. Room modes, room nodes, like your low end sounds one way here, it sounds a different way over here, and it sounds a different way over here. That's mostly low frequency, room modes and nodes. So using frequency analyzers, particularly to help you with those two problems, is not just allowed, but encouraged if you have questions about them. Now, as you go on and you get to know your room really well, you might need them less and less. But as an aid in helping you to learn to understand your room and to help you learn what the differences are between your records and others and to help you compensate for shortcomings of the technology you have, helping you compensate for your headphones are actually surprisingly good in the lows, but not good enough. Let's double check what's happening in low frequency balance on frequency analyzers and not only use our ears because we know the room is somewhat compromised. Now, it's important not to try to have the frequency analyzers mix for you, because if you go in there, look at a frequency analyzer, and you're like, oh, there's a hump there that looks bigger than in other areas. Let me cut that. Oh, there's a dip there that looks smaller than in other areas. Let me boost there. Nah, don't do that. Some humps and dips are good. They're there, then they're part of the tone and the personality of the record. And this record sounds this way because it has more 8K than other records, but that's part of what's making it awesome. And this particular record has a big hump at 100 hertz, but like that's the, the swampy vibe we're going for on this record. Or this record is kind of light in, six, in 100, but has a bunch in 60 and 80, but like, no, it works on this record. Like that's baked into the arrangement and it should be that way. We don't necessarily need to smooth out those things. But what you should do is say, to the best of my ability and to the best of their ability, my speakers and headphones and room are telling me there's a problem somewhere in the lows. I don't know exactly where it is. Is it 80 hertz? Is it 90 hertz? Is it 100 hertz? How am I supposed to know? Am I supposed to have a perfect sense memory for the exact frequency? I don't know. I feel like it's somewhere between... 
90 and 120, and you look at the frequency analyzer, and there's a big hump at 112, and you're like, that must be it. That's it. I bet you that's it. And I bet you you're right. And that's how I recommend using frequency analyzers, generally speaking. But you could also use them to give you information about areas that are just totally not represented by your speakers or headphones. So if you're working on some Sennheiser or maybe some of the popular Sony headphones that have like no low, low frequencies below 100, you could use the frequency analyzers just to make sure your lows aren't like crazy out of whack. That the kick that you're adding doesn't have like way too much 80 hertz and below compared to all of your favorite releases. So that does require some referencing in that case to make your frequency analyzers give you good information. You're going to have to reference other materials so you know what other great sounding material looks like on the frequency analyzer so you know what it means when your material looks a certain way on the frequency analyzer. And this brings us to the last major two items here for translation. Number six is to learn your room, your speakers, your headphones by listening to references on them. Listening to music that you love the sound of on the same exact system that you listen to your own mixes on. And it is amazing to me how many new mixers, new producers, new engineers do not do this. And I know because I was one of them. And I know because so many of the mixed coaching clients or new mastering clients I get who are really new into this also don't do it. And I don't know why exactly we don't do it. But I think the number one most likely reason is that we're scared. And the number two most likely reason is that we're foolishly independent. I know that both of those things were probably the case for me. Can you relate to either of those? Let me know in the comments down below. So number one, you are scared to compare the sounds you have right now to your favorite records back to back because you know how much they're going to fall short. And you don't yet have the skills or the knowledge or the technique to know exactly how to bridge that gap. This is another place where working with a human mastering engineer or working with some type of mix coach or being tapped into some type of community can be extremely beneficial for you. And I want to tell you a little bit more about exactly how to use references. But before we do, I totally forgot to do the sponsor section in this week's podcast. Here I am just delivering value. Well, I want to deliver even more value to you. One thing I can do is tell you about a free plugin that you can get. Actually, a whole free suite of plugins. But before I get there, if you want to tap into a community that is going to get you mix critiquing, mix coaching, in a group setting where we're giving each other constructive criticism, hearing your mixes, hearing how they compare to your favorite releases, consider becoming a member of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. If you've gotten this far in this video, my goodness, congrats to you. You're exactly the type of person who should be a member of the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. Go and click the join button on this or any other video on the Sonic Scoop YouTube channel. Right now, introductory price is $5 a month just as we build this community. The price is going to go up. But I will grandfather you in at this price if you join $5 a month. You will get access to monthly live Q&As with me where the, question, the stuff that you're typing in the chat box right now, I'm going to read and answer, to it, or answer your questions in real time. Guaranteed answers to any question you ask me. Even if you can't make it to the live streams, you send me a question in advance, it will get answered in the next live stream. Guaranteed if you're a member. Also, we're going to have these seasonal mix coaching, mix critique calls where we bring together a whole bunch of mixes from members and you'll be able to learn from the criticism, constructive criticism, critique I give to your mix, but not just criticism and critique, specific actionable ideas that you can employ in your mixes. Actual specific things you can do, including specific EQ points, DB ranges, like, hey, I'm not going to say your vocal's a little too loud. I'm going to give you as close as I can. It's probably in the range of like one and a half to two and a half dB. And you probably need to use a few more dB compression or you probably want to go slightly brighter in the 4K area. Like that kind of specific feedback on your specific mixes is the kind of stuff you'll get in these mix critique, 
mixed coaching calls. And you'll not only be able to learn from that happening to your mixes, but that happening to the mixes of other members. It's going to be a really supportive environment. Check it out. Introductory pricing on that YouTube membership. So click the join button. But if you want to go even deeper and you want to get a whole system for mixing, check out Mixing Breakthroughs. If you've listened for this long, this is the biggest piece of advice that I could give you that's going to help you more than anything else I can say to you. And that is by my full-length course, Mixing Breakthroughs. I made this thing to help you make sure that you can mix faster, better, with more creativity and more confidence than ever before. There's a 100% money-back guarantee on it. We've got great feedback on it. If you're here in the comments or the live chat and you've taken Mixing Breakthroughs, let people know right now in the comments or in the chat how much it's helped you. Because I've heard from so many students that like it changed the way they mixed overnight. And really going through the exercises in that course, which is the biggest thing, transformed the way they mixed and really saw them level up from the plateau they were at immediately. And it sets you up on a trajectory to get even better and better over time because you're going to have a better understanding, conceptual framework, and a set of processes and systems for how to go about mixing that can last you the rest of your career in mixing. If you want to learn everything I know about mastering, we've got the full course on mastering, mastering demystified. If you really want to learn how to make things translate in a really granular level, and also compression breakthroughs. If you want to finally learn how to hear, understand, and use compression like a pro. Last two quick shout outs, and then I'll get into this idea on references really quick. Number one shout out here, Sound Toys, making some of my favorite mixing effects in the known universe. Try out anything they make for free for 30 days, soundtoys.com, and GPU Audio. Right now, they are giving away a whole bundle of modulation tools, things like Horse Phasers or Flanger, for free that run on the GPU in your computer, as well as a free convolution reverb. Check them out over at gpu.audio slash sonicscoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonicscoop. There's Mac support on their free convolution reverb and PC support on their modulation bundle, as well as a convolution reverb. So check that stuff out. All right, now here is arguably the other biggest piece of advice I can give you for helping your mixes translate better. And that is to get to know your room inside and out by listening to records that you know and love the sound of in the actual listening environment where you mix your music. It sounds so obvious, but so many of us are too scared to do it, or maybe too foolishly independent to do it. Whether you're mixing on monitors or mixing on headphones, this is an absolute must. Now, there's two sides of things here, though. One is getting to know what that music sounds like. And number two is potentially doing direct comparisons between your work and the commercial releases you love. How exactly to do those direct comparisons and when, man, that's a topic for a whole other video. I've done a podcast episode on exactly how to use references, so I won't go into extreme detail here. But when it comes to mastering, I would say that some A being of the overall tonal balance of your release compared to other releases in your style is essential. When it comes to mixing, I think that's less essential. But I think in the mixing process, you can A, tune your brain and ears and body for the day, just like you tune a guitar or tune a drum kit before you start playing it. You tune your ear, you tune your mind, you tune your body with references. And that's how you make better decisions during the mix, by tuning yourself to music that you love the sound of, so you remember what great sounds like in your room before you start working on stuff in your room. And then occasionally, when you need an ear break, when you've become fatigued, when you've lost perspective, you refresh yourself by reminding yourself what great sounds like in your room. And it just kind of resets your perspective. But you can also use those references to help you solve problems in mixing. If you find yourself debating with yourself, how loud the vocal should be, how loud the snare should be, how much reverb there should be on this element. Listen to the way a bunch of other great mixes solve that particular problem. It might not be the right answer for your mix, but it'll give you a sense of the ranges of acceptable outcomes, different levels that good could be. But there's another part of referencing We've talked about referencing other material in the environment you're in. That's number six. But secret number seven, and this is the thing that you've got to spend a tremendous number of hours doing to really learn your room, is to go out there with those mixes that aren't translating well 
and listen to them in all these other environments next to some of your favorite commercial releases. You got to make a playlist of some of your favorite sounding releases that are relevant to the project you're working on and listen to those in the car together. Listen to your mix in the car and say, oh man, my mix sounds crappy in the car. But then listen to all of your other favorite releases in the car. Do they sound crappy in the same way or do they sound crappy in different ways? This is going to give you a lot of insight. When you go to a new studio, listen to some of your favorite releases in that new studio so that you can get a sense for what music you know and love sounds like in that room so that then once you listen to your release in that new room, you'll know a lot more about what good should sound like in that room before you start second guessing your mix just based on hearing it in a room where you have no idea what that room sounds like or is supposed to sound like. The same thing with a new pair of headphones. And also, if you're doing the car check, one little last tiny piece of advice I'll give you. For those of you who listen to the radio, do not compare your mixes directly to FM radio. This is becoming less and less relevant by the year, but there's still some people who listen to FM radio and use that as a reference. If you're going to take music on your phone that you've plugged into your you know, dashboard on your car and hit play on it, it is not going through FM radio processing. And it will and should sound significantly different than the stuff that you're hearing on the radio. You can do this experiment for yourself. The next time a big song comes on the radio, Smells Like Teen Spirit comes on the FM radio, like pull it up on Spotify and play back to back at the same moment in the song and flip back and forth between here smells like teen spirit on FM radio, here smells like teen spirit, like the actual, you know, version of the song or do it with, you know, Bruno Mars track. It doesn't have to be as dated of a reference now. I'm showing myself as a child of the 90s that it's the first radio reference that comes to my mind. But, you know, um, whatever track, am I even dated for bringing up like Uptown Funk? Is even that showing my age? Man, Uptown Funk's a good track. But say if it's Uptown Funk, a track I will not turn off if it comes on the radio. Also, Britney Spears' Toxic, I will not turn that off if it comes on the radio. Neil Young, Heart of Gold, I will not turn that off if it comes on the radio. Let me know your favorites that you do not turn off if they come on the radio in the comments down below. But cue up like that song on Spotify or, you know, Apple Music or whatever and listen to it against the radio version, and you will get a sense for why you should not compare the sound of your mix directly to how FM radio sounds in your car. And if all the listening that you're doing in your car is on FM radio, and then you compare your mix off of your phone plugged into your car, you're not getting a good sense of how that mix should sound in that car. So much better for you to load it up on a playlist and listen against other things. I don't even know if I'm dating myself by mentioning the existence of FM radio, but apparently millions of people still listen to this stuff. And occasionally I do as well. Like I accidentally have my radio on somehow in the car and like a cool song comes on. So I listen to it and I'm like, how am I listening to the radio? I guess I still listen to the radio occasionally. I didn't even do it on purpose. So anyway, I hope that's one, uh, something that's useful for you and maybe something you didn't consider. Of course, the extra, extra bonus tip here is for mixes that translate even better, make better sounding records. <laughs> do better arrangements, do better performances, do better recordings, just mix better. And, you know, honestly, if you have a killer song and it doesn't translate exactly the way you want it to, it's still killer. But if you get all this stuff right, I think you'd be a lot a lot happier. Let me know which one of these points was your favorite from this list in the comments down below. We are excerpting short clips from each of these podcast episodes now, because as you see, I can speak extemporaneously for like an hour on stuff that gets me passionate and riled up, like how mixes translate and how they can translate better. So if you had a favorite moment in this podcast, let me know what it was in the comments or in the live chat, and I will cut out a snippet for a short section or just for a relatively short clip. And that way, in your travel on the YouTubes or the Facebooks or the Instagrams, you can maybe encounter that nugget of wisdom. Hopefully it's wisdom. Is that vain? I'm not saying my own nuggets of wisdom. But hopefully you can encounter that nugget that helped you again. Because repetition really is how we learn. And some of this stuff that I've told you, maybe you heard before but didn't stick. And maybe today is the day that it stuck. But maybe you'll still need a reminder a week from now. So I'm happy to make those short clips for you and they'll be out there. 
Well, thanks again so much for joining me for this week's episode. Listen, I want to go even deeper with you. If you liked this week's episode, you're going to love what we do in the members only section. We have the live Q and A's where I respond to your chats in real time. And I can also give you guaranteed answers on questions that come in advance from members. And we'll do those members only mixed critiques, which is going to be huge in fulfilling. What was it? Number four, some of those benefits of working with human mastering engineers and human coaches to help you improve your translation. So I hope you click the join button, but really the best thing you can do if you want to mix better than ever before is just take my full length mixing course. I make this plea, not just because I want you to buy stuff from me, which I do. I make this plea because I know it's going to actually help you. That's the feedback I get again and again. And it really does touch me when people write to me and say, man, I took that course and I'm doing the best mixes I ever did. Like, a week later. And I listen to their prior mixes and their new mixes, and they're right. So that's one of the best things I can do for you. Go over to mixingbreakthroughs.com. If you want an extra discount on it, become a member over the Sonic Scoop member section. You'll get an extra discount code uh, for an additional 5% off of Mixing Breakthroughs course. And I'll stack on top of any sale that might be going on when you see this. If you want to go really granular on translation and getting EQ curves right and tonal balances right for songs, then check out Mastering Demystified, which you can get at MasteringDemystified.com. And if you really want to learn to understand and hear compression, finally, so you can really hear the subtleties of what your compressor's settings are doing, and you want to finally be able to use it like a pro, with great confidence, Compression Breakthroughs is the course for you. I know you're going to love it. All of these come with a 30-day money-back guarantee. And last but not least, Sound Toys. If you want some more plugins, check out Sound Toys plugins. They make some of my favorites. You can try out anything they make for 30 days for free over at SoundToys.com. And last but not least, GPU Audio are giving away right now for Mac and PC users a free convolution reverb at gpu.audio slash sonicscoop. That's gpu.audio slash sonic scoop type gpu.audio slash sonic scoop into your browser wherever you are get a free convolution reverb for mac and pc users and if you're on pc there's also right now a whole modulation bundle that's really fun that you can take advantage of man i hope you will go even deeper with me on this stuff i'm going to read through your chats uh, after i get off of here and next week we will not have a public live stream at 3 30 on wednesday we are going to have the behind the scenes members only live stream 3.30 next Wednesday. So if you are a member, I'm excited to see you for that. You can basically type a question on any single YouTube video on the Sonic Scoop channel with the word members question in it. Just type the word member question, member question in the comment section, any YouTube video, including this one, and I will answer that question in the next members only live stream coming up one week from today. Same rock and roll time, same rock and roll place. And get ready because we're going to do the next mixed critique session for the members only as well, where you'll get customized specific advice on your own mixes and where you can learn from the transformation of your fellow members' mixes. Check out whatever other video I also have up here on the end screen because I'm going to make it super relevant to today's topic. Maybe I'll put up the one on references there or my video on how to use frequency analyzers in mixing. Man, those are two things that are going to help you out tremendously. Being able to use frequency analyzers in mixing, being able to use references well in mixing. It's going to help you out a lot with today's topic. Thanks again for joining me. This has been Justin Coletti of Sonic Scoop on the Sonic Scoop podcast. See you next time.